Watch those curvy lines turn All the points I should equal From the center of the swirl All the points are equal distance I'm swinging my right arm because I'm short Circles wet and triangles go And rectangle to the shapes I don't know These plain, plain figures straight inside as I can show You've got three of the straight lines, three angles and the short, a triangle and sharp, and I may not be the best, but the love is only three points for me, better than the rest. So Take a bow, take a bow. I believe firmly that we are all born to be artists, no matter how old we are. We all were born with this amazing creative capacity for expression. And a lot of times uh, we lose that throughout our lives. We turn to other things, uh, we go away from it. And uh, a lot of uh, my work is around the idea that, that uh, my, my love for Elizabeth and family and just kids in general, that uh, I sort of refuse to accept the fact that when Elizabeth has grown up, when she's older, you know, an old person, like 11 or 12, <laughs> Uh, that she'll enter a system where uh, it's no more, it's not this anymore. Like, this is not acceptable for learning. It's you sit and you listen and that's it. I'm sorry, and forever. Uh, I, I, I refuse to accept that for any of the kids in our country. So uh, this is me at Elizabeth's age, five years old. Uh, Elizabeth started playing violin just like I did when she was two. I started playing violin when I was two. And... I had sort of a traumatic childhood from a musical standpoint, or because of music, or music, I can't remember, but uh, it's mostly because of the outfits. This one wasn't so bad. <laughs> this was just, it looked pretty sharp there, actually, but if you look closely, I've got this big frown on my face. I, I, you could say I was really focusing, but I think I was just um, somewhat angry, or, or not. This is not a therapy session, I'm sorry. And, so the interesting uh, thing, what happens when you, develop, uh, when you develop music skills when you're that young, I was Suzuki trained, so that you learn music like a language as you learn your language. So what this has done for me now that I'm 35 years old, uh, it allowed me a number of different skill sets to draw from. And one of them is that I don't see the world like probably most people see the world. I see the world in terms of music. Uh, uh, there's a part of my brain that is sort of switched on that has been developed where I look at something like this and these are notes that I took on a whiteboard about mitosis, uh, cell division. And most people look at this and be like, okay, there's, there's some steps and some things and it's kind of chaotic, but it's, I, I see this information, it's familiar to me. I look at this and I see poetry. My, my brain makes poetry out of chaos and then I take that poetry and I look at the poetry and then my brain also makes music out of that poetry and my job is to take uh, what I hear in my head, other than the voices, uh, take what I hear in my head, okay, that's, okay, yep, uh, what I hear in my head and, and translate that into recorded music to help 
students learn things like shapes or things like mitosis. So I just want to take you through sort of the creative process of what I go through to create something like this. And in this particular case, I wrote those lyrics, I wrote that poetry from that chaos, and then I heard 11 layers. And the first layer uh, is an acoustic guitar that I put on and I record everything, well, most of the things myself, usually, uh, and then layer one at a time. So I start with the acoustic guitar and this is what it might look like. So you notice I had a metronome in my headphones before I started playing, it was like click, click, click. So I play the whole song, just the acoustic guitar of that whole song, all the way through with the headphones on. And now that I have the acoustic guitar and that click in my headphones, I can put on drums. All right, so now I have acoustic guitar and drums in my headphones. I can add an electric bass. And maybe add an electric bass. Well, take my word for it. <laughs> so I added an electric bass and a banjo, and it looked very similar to that. I had, somehow those got deleted. So now, uh, what I would do, uh, since my parents were in town, uh, when I recorded this song a couple of weeks ago, uh, my parents are both musicians, and we, uh, I had my mom, and my mom and I put down some string parts. She plays violin, uh, she started a music school when I was young, and so this is our string part to this song. Notice a couple things. If you look up here, there, yes, there's a framed picture of me and an article uh, behind me in there. And also, uh, it's funny because that wasn't the take we, we ended up uh, using. And you'll see my mom's expression there. It's, it's, uh, she didn't actually hit the note uh, perfectly the left. So she has a, a little frown. And there, my mom's right up here, just in case anybody missed that. So now, uh, and my dad uh, also uh, is a musician and he uh, was a, a record, uh, a studio owner when I was growing up, so I was in the recording studio as a young person. And my dad's philosophy, well he had two philosophies of music. One was, if it doesn't sound good, turn it up. <laughs> if it doesn't sound good, turn it up. <laughs> okay, wonder why that happened. And then the other one was uh, uh, simplicity with authority. And this is a good example of simplicity with authority. Um, it's a, he put on a simple piano part, but he's playing it with conviction, and you can hear his fingernails hit those, hit those keys. Intense, Pop. Intense. <laughs> so then uh, in, uh, we decided to put on some hand clap parts, so the three of us stood around a microphone and did a hand clap track. <laughs> it's exciting, I right know. Here comes another one. I know, right? It's incredible. <laughs> so then uh, my mom came in. Uh, we, she was out gardening and she came in. It was like 105 degrees outside. She came inside and I was playing the bridge of the song and she comes into the studio and, and was going, woo, woo. So I'm like, let's, let's do it. Thank <laughs> you. 
That one, the last one was intense. It really was. <laughs> All right, another, another really exciting part. So uh, to accentuate some of the drums, I put on a maraca track. Okay, so then the rhythm track is pretty much done. Now I, t I go back and take that uh, poetry that I've written before and then turn it into melody and sing it to, this, to these, these layers, these tracks, this rhythm track. So here's what my vocal might look like. We got 46 calls on that 46 pair of jazz and the fry that for two die. I know, it is clever, that is clever. <laughs> so then uh, I rewind it and put the last layer on, which is I sing a background vocal part to bring out some of the, the bigness of the chorus, and here's what that looks like. And notice the end is very dramatic. I knew I was being filmed. Yeah. All right, so we have all the layers done. Now we can listen to the final product. So using, using music in the classroom is an interesting uh, strategy and it's one that is very, can be very effective and exciting. And one of the things that I do is explore how to extract the, most pos the, the highest value out of using music in the classroom because listening to a song like this and reading the lyrics is absolutely, even talking, talking through the lyrics is scratching the surface, surface of using music in the classroom. Uh, so I've designed something called kinesthetic lectures, and you saw some remnants of this for kindergarten up here. But uh, it's basically uh, the understanding that when music was first intuited, uh, there was no difference between music and theater. 
our bodies were a way of telling stories and music was a way of making it more engaging. So that's what I'm trying to uh, connect with and creating these kinesthetic lectures, I'll talk about a part of the song and then connect it to kinesthetic. So I'd like to go through a sample of that with you guys. So if everybody would please stand up, that would be great. <coughs> and if you would, uh, raise your right arm please. Okay, that's good. Notice it looks like I'm raising my left arm. I swear to you I'm not. Uh, turn to your right. Uh, your other right. Uh, wait, yep, okay, good, good. And then turn, turn, so notice I'm, turn the other way. And then turn back straight forward here. Put your arm down. Keep that in mind when we watch these videos. The chorus is about an overview of interphase to mitosis. So in interphase, a human cell has 46 chromosomes, and in the S stage of interphase, those chromosomes replicate, so we end up having 92 chromosomes, or 46 pairs of chromosomes, because they're the new and the old are attached, uh, and we call those sister chromatids. So uh, that's actually enough genetic material to have two diploid cells. And at the end of the interphase, then it goes to that final check to make sure that everything is in place, that everything's been replicated appropriately to be able to go into mitosis to create those two independent cells. So here's how the chorus goes. The first part goes, we've got 46 chromosomes, now 46 pairs. Yeah, that's enough right there for two diploid cells. Here's how we're going to demonstrate that part. We've got 46 chromosomes. Now 46, 46 pairs. Yeah, that's a to the right. right there for two diploid cells. Okay, let's try that one more time. We've got 46 chromosomes. Now 46 pairs. Yeah, that's enough right there for two diploid cells. Okay, good. The second part. Prepared an interphase, now there's no place to hide. Oh, hey, mitosis, maybe we will divide. Here's how I'm going to demonstrate this part. So, prepared an interphase, now there's no place to hide. Oh, hey, mitosis, maybe we will divide. All right, let's try it slowly all together. We've got 46 chromosomes, now 46 pairs. Yeah, that's enough right there for two diploid cells. Prepare an interphase, now there's no place to hide. Oh, hey, mitosis, maybe we will divide. All right, let's try it with the music. <laughs> Good, I think. Can't see. Okay, uh, you guys can sit down if you'd like. Uh, great job, I think, great job. I didn't really uh, see what was going on, but it seemed like there was lots of movement. Uh, so that's good, that's good. I heard it's, it's fabulous, so that's what we're looking for. Now, uh, this is, so I, I, I do this project called Fizz, and Fizz is all about using this very simple technology in a simple way to transform the classroom. And what that means is uh, using one take video. A uh, very simple video. All the videos we just watched, the kinesthetic lecture, the introduction, were all one-take videos. The understanding that hit record, do something, hit stop, and you're done. Uh, any, any choices above and beyond that make it really, really difficult to use video in the classroom. Because a lot of the teachers in here 
professors as well probably have done one video project and they're like that was crazy it got way far away from the content because the students were arguing over what color the title slide should be and what's the first transition and that took four days whereas the video took five minutes you know uh, that stops being about math real quick and starts being about uh, a, a strange use of technology so basically the the uh, the the learning framework here for fizz is what we're looking at up the vertical axis we have bloom's revised taxonomy from lower order thinking skills to higher order thinking skills, from remembering to the higher order thinking skill of creating new products and ideas. And I think that Bloom's ta revised taxonomy is actually incomplete. That if we are having students create new products and ideas in the classroom, it's a logical next step to grab the devices in our pockets and have them publish those ideas. Because doing a lab in class with the end result of you're going to come up at the end of the day and talk about, you know, do a, a, a summary of your lab results and stand up and say, okay, well, we found this, we found this, and then sit down. That's a completely different assignment than you're going to make a 30-second video of your findings of this lab, and we're going to post this to, the, to a global audience on YouTube where anybody might see it, certainly larger than our classroom. Beginning with that end in mind puts a, an additional level of rigor on any assignment. And using one take video is a really powerful way of getting to that extra level of rigor. Now along the horizontal axis we have Howard Garner's multiple intelligences. Just a guide to think, okay, in this room right here we have individuals that are strong in different intelligences. Probably when we stood up a second ago to do that kinesthetic lecture, there were people in here like, finally, yes, this is how I learn, I love it. Right? And there was probably some people in here be like, just give me the notes. You know, I don't, do not assess me on this. I don't dance, you know. Um, and I'd like to, uh, everybody dances. We all have these, so uh, it's just some, some better than others. But uh, they're, they're different intelligences, and if we tap into those, uh, so the FIS framework is to provide a guide for best practices according to, this, uh, uh, to these ideas here, these, uh, these individual theories. And best practice would be that with every lesson we have, we provide the, the, the highest amount of rigor for our students, which is I'm putting it on you to create and publish a result of your work. That's what you're going to be doing today. And I'm going to have activities that hit as many learning styles as possible. This is the most rigorous and relevant education we can offer for our students on a day-to-day -day basis. And what FIS stands for, the FI stands for Friday Institute, and FIS is all about, if you look at this as a sort of what, come, what bubbles to the top, so like FIS bubbles to the top, but not only that, but it spreads out across uh, this framework, and that's the most rigorous and relevant. So uh, two, uh, almost, yeah, almost two years ago, I retreated to my house where I have a recording studio. You saw the, the picture of me? That's, uh, yeah. And uh, I retreated to that room specifically, and I wrote an album about Algebra 1 from the number system to exponential functions, 13 songs. I did that in like a month and a half and I celebrated myself. I thought, oh man, I am awesome. Uh, I am fantastic and nobody else can do that. And that's one of the reasons I did it because nobody else can do that. So I do a lot of professional development with teachers across the country and I decided, okay, well the next step, and I created all these materials to, to help teachers make music videos with their students, to help them create and publish their own learning using these songs, because songs are a great way to get students to create and publish their own learning and get engaged in the process of learning. Well, I, I got a room full of Algebra 1 teachers, which is frightening, but the, <laughs> so I had a room. <laughs> Uh, some of you know what I'm talking about, some of you don't, but take my word for it. Uh, so a room full of Algebra 1 teachers, and we went through this. I said, you know, all hail, uh, uh, I, create, I have come down and created something amazing for you, and, and let me show you, and it is music and theater. And I played some of this stuff for them, and we made some music videos as a, as a group, and we watched them back, and we went, they created and published their learning and loved it. Everybody was laughing, having a great time. It's the greatest. You know, and people came up to me afterwards and said, this was the best professional. This is so much fun, and we don't ever have to have, get to have fun. We got to step out. We got to do all sorts of amazing things. And I said, well, that's great. I'm so excited that that happened. Uh, I can't wait to see what your students create. And then it was silent. I said, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> no, no, no. I can't do this in my classroom ever like you <laughs> yeah right um, I don't have time you don't you don't understand like I know that you like your music and everything but you don't understand um, I can I can't even get through my content day to day like I, I'm cranking I'm just killing it with the content I can't get through my content so what what this I, I, I it took me back because I was like okay well creating stuff 
because that's what I've been doing for a long time, creating stuff. Like I'll create this music of all, this, uh, all, this, all, all these materials, all these handouts to try to get people to do uh, uh, great things that are going to engage uh, children for the next generation of learners. And creating stuff wasn't the answer. It has to come in tandem with something else because the, pr the problem was time. If no one has time to do anything new, that is the barrier, not more stuff. I don't need more stuff. There's tons of stuff. Uh, so what I, what I did was I went and observed a lot of different classrooms, uh, mostly middle school and high school, were attached to a public middle school at, at work. So I spent a lot of time over there, spent a lot of time in the high school where I taught, and I spent a lot of time reflecting on my own teaching uh, uh, career, and I realized that the question is not, what, where's the stuff? The question is, how do we use our time? That is how we use our time consistently, and not everybody, but most people, especially we get to the higher grade levels. We speak, well, ironically, guess what? That's what I'm doing right now. Uh, we speak to a certain uh, uh, intelligence of students, the students that can sit and listen for a long period of time, and uh, we expect them to go outside of the classroom and apply their learning by themselves. Hi, my name is Dr. Lodge McCann from the Friday Institute in Raleigh, North Carolina. And I'm here to tell you, there's a serious problem in American education. There's too much lecture in the classroom, which is not engaging for our students. Too much of the time, education today looks something like this. We have students in the classroom, and we lecture to them, which is inefficient, not engaging, and a one-shot deal. When we send them out of the classroom, they require their learning individually, which is also not engaging. I started a project called FID to train teachers to fill up the classroom. That way, outside the classroom, students are now watching FID's video lecture series created by their teachers in a style like what we're watching right now. We've got a camera and a tripod, I have boards and information on the slide. This is an extremely efficient way of delivering information to these students. They can be viewed multiple times and it creates classroom time. That way, in classroom, we can focus on differentiated instruction with the teacher as a facilitator of collaboration, applying, creating, and publishing exciting and engaging products of student learning. So in an effort to try to solve that problem, because the problem is time, so where do we use our time and how can we um, innovate on our use of time? Uh, that is what I came up with fairly quickly. So the first two questions, of course, uh, what about students without any access? We've been doing this for a while now. So what about students without any access and what, what happens if students don't watch the videos? Okay, uh, just to cover those quickly so I don't lose anybody. Uh, students without any access, we are finding schools and teachers being extremely creative about this problem. First of all, I want to say that this device right here is changing everything in sort of a delivery of, of these types of lessons because this device is relatively inexpensive and if people don't have access at home, many of them have access to a device like this, which is, which is changing rapidly. Uh, the second thing, teachers are burning DVDs of their videos for their students, for students who have DVDs at home. Teachers are having students bring in thumb drives and dropping the videos on the thumb drives and they can take those home if they have a computer and not access. And they're being very creative about how they use in-class time. Uh, we can watch, the videos are relatively short, so you can watch the videos uh, uh, before school, uh, during lunch, or after school. Or they're, again, they're being very creative with the time actually in school because that is a, a supported environment where they have access to that that kind of uh, material uh, online. So the next thing we found out, which was, which was amazing, uh, it truly was this sort of economic thinking and, and it, it, uh, an efficiency shift that what we found out across different content areas, and we mostly looked at uh, uh, middle school, upper elementary school, middle school, high school, and then some in college. And we started to see this trend that in class, a 75 minute lecture, when put on video, ends up being 15 minutes. 60 minute lecture, 10 minutes, 45 minute lecture, 8 minutes, 30 minute lecture, 5 minutes. And our, our question, this was a while ago, our question was, why? And of course it's different for the different grade areas, but in, let's say, 6 through 12, so that kind of middle, middle area there of, of middle school and high school, it's amazing. It changed, it changed the way I look at education. It's classroom management. So let's take this mitosis, this is the, the lecture for that song I was just doing, uh, a, a lecture on mitosis. So let's just start from scratch. You, you guys are my class. Hey, okay, so today we're gonna uh, talk about mitosis and everybody, okay, um, will you get out your notebook please? Because we, okay. 
Okay, so, so today we're going to talk about mitosis. And, can you wake up? Every day? Really? Every day? Okay. <laughs> Okay, proximity control for the person who's not waking up, and okay, now she's awake. Okay, mitosis today is gonna. Well, I'm so I'm super excited about mitosis, and then there's a kid in the back who says, "My dad knows everything about my." And then five minutes later, you're like, and every every other kid in the room is just, you know, that kid. You know, there's somebody in here that is that person. I don't. It's it's all good, but you know, everybody else in the room is now disengaged, and it takes. Okay, come on, come on. Okay, mitosis, mitosis. Okay, that's good. I'm glad your your dad knows a lot about that stuff. Mitosis. Here we go. And I haven't even started yet. We've all experienced that, right? It's a nightmare. And what the real nightmare is is that that's first period. <laughs> yeah. Bell rings. Those students leave. The next group comes in. Hey everybody, mitosis. <laughs> Can you please wake up? Can you get out your pen? And I know your dad knows a lot about this. I don't want to hear about it. Um, and that's fine. Uh, but that's something, okay, and guess what? Fourth period, here we go again. So I give that same lecture that's inconsistent. By fourth period, I'm just, I don't even want to hear it anymore. I'm the only person in the room that did not need to hear it over and over and over because you in the back, you aren't even paying attention to begin with. So I'm just talking, blah, 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 right? And the funny thing is, this lecture on mitosis is a 60-minute in-class lecture. This is a 10-minute video. Once. Once. I'm done. This is what I have to say about mitosis. And why, why would I need to say it for three hours in a day? Don't. I don't. It's an inefficient practice, and it's what I call the Great Depression of teaching. <laughs> <laughs> so there are two parts to flipping the classroom, from my perspective, to keep it very, very simple. The first part is video. And what we have built at the Friday Institute, the strategy we've built, is a, a setup like this. Again, it's the same technology. All, all these strategies we talk about are using an inexpensive camera, the easiest one that you can find to use in a one-take fashion, that anybody can start doing any of these strategies tomorrow, as long as you have a simple device to do it. And phones are a simple device as well. So the setup is what I have uh, set up up here. And so I just want to go through kind of a simulation. And uh, if it, I just want to play an example video for you, an example, very short, one-minute lecture on an economic topic. So if, I'm going to go ahead and do that now. Diminishing marginal utility. Now, marginal utility is an increase or decrease in pleasure achieved by consuming one additional unit. So diminishing marginal utility is a decrease in pleasure or utility each unit consumed. Let's take a pizza, for example. I eat one slice, and I love pizza, but I eat one slice of pizza, and I give it a rating of a 1 to 10 based on how much pleasure, or a 0 to 10, really, based on how much pleasure I get from that pizza. So I eat one piece, and I love it, because I love pizza. I give it a 10. All right, so now I eat a second piece, and I get a little bit less pleasure out of it, because I'm not as hungry. So I give that about an 8. Still like pizza though. The third piece, I'm really, I'm really filling up here. So the third piece, like ah, you know that, like I give that about three. It's not a whole lot of pleasure from that third piece or utility. And by the time I finish my fourth piece, I'm like, okay, I didn't really get any pleasure out of that at all. I give that zero. So this is a decrease in pleasure or utility for each additional unit consumed. Okay, a basic lecture, one minute lecture on uh, diminishing margin of utility. Now, if that was a live lecture, if I just gave that lecture, and I send you out now to go apply your learning on this, give you some problems, uh, a lot of you will be like, I, I was checking my phone when he said that. I don't, rem I don't even know what this is. Like, I was zoned out, I, I, wasn't, he I wasn't even here, uh, I was, whatever, I was looking at it, but I don't, I don't get it. One of the beautiful things about this is now uh, we're going to watch it again, and if you would take mental notes, or if you want to sketch some things down, that'd be fine, but I want you to take some kind of notes, and we're going to watch this one more time. Diminishing marginal utility. Now, marginal utility is an increase or decrease in pleasure achieved by consuming one additional unit. So, diminishing marginal utility is a decrease in pleasure or utility for each unit consumed. Let's take a pizza, for example. I eat one slice, and I love pizza. Uh, I eat one slice of pizza, and I give it a rating of a 1 to 10 based on how much pleasure, or 0 to 10, really, based on how much pleasure I get from that pizza. So I eat one piece, and I love it, because I love pizza. I give it a 10. All right, so now I eat a second piece, and I get a little bit less pleasure out of it, because I'm not as hungry. So I give that about an 8. I still like pizza, though. 
The third piece, I'm really, I'm really filling up here. So the third piece, like, ah, I get to the end of that, like, I get that about three, not a whole lot of pleasure from that third piece or utility. And by the time I finish my fourth piece, I'm like, okay, I didn't really get any pleasure out of that at all. So give that a zero. So this is a decrease in pleasure or utility for each additional unit consumed. Okay, I need two volunteers. Uh, you may come up as a pair if you need uh, uh, someone to uh, uh, coach you or, or help you or feel confident uh, on the stage. So I need two volunteers, and I, the, your job is going to be recreate this one-minute lecture. And then you're going to, I've got a little station up here, you're going to prepare the board with the information. Are you two my volunteers? Yes. Oh, pfft, I didn't even have to ask. Let's hear it for them. Sweet. Fantastic. I like pizza. <laughs> nice. Good, good. What's your name? Doug. Doug. Jade. Jade. Okay, come on over here. Okay, so they're going to prepare the board with the information, and then we're going to do a quick uh, filming of their version of this lecture. Now, um, so just give me one second. I need to coach them for one second. Okay, while they work, when we started looking at this flip in the classroom idea, uh, I did some research and looked at the literature on if we're going to be delivering this type of information online and suggesting and, and promoting this, then uh, we need to look at, at what, what's out there in terms of the research and best practices. What, what are the best ways to do this? And what we found was sort of interesting because uh, most people think about delivering something like this. We're like, oh, we'll do screencasts and use Camtasia and use all this technology. Well, it seemed as though the research did not suggest that that was the best way of doing it uh, because what we, we looked at two basic things. We looked at uh, what it means to have a front row seat. And the reason why we looked at this is because uh, emotional cues, you guys down here have a much different, after this hour and a half is over, have a much different relationship with me. You feel a different kind of affect toward me than you in the back. Like you, you, in the, you, don't, you have no relationship with me whatsoever. You don't understand my cues. You, know, you don't know how much I'm fidgeting, all that kind of stuff. And I talk to you guys. So, it seems, so students who sit in the front row do better. And so what we tried to do was to have a better than a front row seat. That was what we were shooting for, as we want students to have, be, be conversational. And the amazing thing about this is that I, I, people come up to me all the time and say, I feel like I know you and you're really tall. You know, I feel like you, I know you, I've watched all your videos, like we're buddies. Like I have no idea who you are. <laughs> I've never seen you before in my life. It's because it's, so, it's very conversational. It's very like sitting across the table from a tutor. So that's, uh, that was our first lesson from the research, that that environment, front row seat, is both powerful and personal. Second thing was that the, the research suggested that uh, as close as you can get to a human-to-human -human contact uh, with the video or online, the more powerful and engaging that will be. So that includes using eye contact, facial cues, and gesturing in your presentation. That's going to be the most personal and engaging way. And what we also found is that videos over about a minute and a half, it doesn't matter. Anything a minute and a half or less, you can have any kind of video you want and engagement will be fine. Anything over a minute and a half, it starts to go straight down unless you employ some of these techniques, uh, which is sort of logical. And speaking of logic, so I, I, I look at the research, but I also kind of think about things logically. I don't just rely on the research. So the logic behind this is something that I remember from Maryville College. And one of the most impactful things I ever did at Maryville College was uh, they, I'm going to use the word forced, because it's funny. They, they forced me to film myself teaching to put a camera in the back of the room and you had the students here and I was in front and I was talking about this and I was fidgeting with my lanyard and breaking it and, and, and going like this and saying, uh, every five seconds, you know, that kind of thing. And you know what? They made me watch it back with them. It, was, it, was, it caused terrible disequilibrium. I was like, I don't want to, oh, I don't want to watch this. But you know what? It, it made me so much better just one time. Like, I, I fixed a lot of that. And that stuff makes you confident. It makes you a master at your content to review how and what you say. It's incredible. It's, it's, it's like magic, you know? Uh, watching that back and reflecting on what you've recorded. So it causes major disequilibrium. What an amazing thing to get good at, right? Because you're not going to be good at it when you start. After 10 or 15 videos, you are a different teacher. 
you're a more reflective teacher and you understand yourself and the confidence involved in you projecting your content. Uh, I love this too because it's very simple and analog. It forces people to make choices, which making choices is a very difficult thing. It's another level of disequilibrium. If you get good at making choices, what you need to put on this board for general understanding, and my boards don't look amazing or anything, I just got some basic information, that's what I want to talk about. So you have to make choices about refining and what's important. And then uh, uh, reflection, I'll, I'll, I've said that already, but the reflection of, of uh, going through this process and how this process makes you such a better teacher. I work with uh, a lot of undergraduates at North Carolina State University. And undergraduates aren't the most confident people, especially in their content. They're learning pedagogy, they're learning strategies. But when it comes to content, usually they're, you know, they, oh, I'll learn it out of the book the first year, I'll stay one day ahead, that kind of mentality. Um, but I've seen an amazing transformation after 10 or 15 of these videos. An amazing transformation in their confidence uh, and working with a few undergrads very closely that come out with me and present where they, there's no way they could have done that before. They are owning the stage, they own the content, they own the pedagogy, they totally believe in what they're doing because they've reflected on what they've, uh, of, of, of what they recorded. And if you think about it, we tell teachers to tell students, higher level thinking is creation. Higher level thinking is creation. So be creative, create, create. And then we go, creation doesn't work because my students aren't creative because they don't know what I'm talking about. And you need to model it. And what a great and effective way to model creation than to walk in the first day of class and say, I have recorded everything I have to say about biology for you guys, I've recorded it. It's all personal, it's all gonna connect with your parents and you at home and build this relationship. It's done. Now let's get down to work. And work does not mean me repeating the same lecture three times a day and getting depressed about not being effective. Work means now you create. Okay, speaking of that, you guys ready? <laughs> I will take that as a yes. The, the nervous laughter, you going first. No, you're going first. Oh, crap. You walked up first. Okay, so go ahead and sit down in this chair, please. Don't make fun. Don't hate. Okay, as soon as you see the red light go, just at your own pace, go through the information. You can scoot, scooch back a little bit. I'm scooching. Yep. Are we scooching? Oops. We're good. I'm going to put this here. Sure. You'll probably need a marker. I do. Mm-hmm. Is that the bad blue one? I don't know. Okay. Okay, nice and loud so everybody can hear you. And three, two. Okay, everybody, we're learning diminishing marginal utility today. Food is fun. That's what we're learning. Okay, first of all, what it is, diminishing marginal utility. First, you need to know what marginal utility is. So that's what we're going to do. Marginal utility. De increase, decrease in pleasure by each unit you consume. So I like burgers. So we're going to talk about burgers today. So the thing is, is that if I have one burger, pretty good burger. So my marginal utility, that's what we're going to deal with. But as far as diminishing marginal utility, it's a decrease in pleasure by how many burgers I go in. So first of all, look, first burger, McDonald's makes me happy. Hello, look at me, all right? One burger, we're good to go, right? So I'm pretty happy over here, right? Two burgers, okay, I'm a little fat kid, feeling a little bad, okay? Third burger, I'm not happy, indigestion central, right? Not good. So basically, as I increase the unit, I got more and more and more depressed. Therefore, food is fun, right? That's what I'm saying. So diminishing marginal utility is the more burgers you eat, the bigger and more unhappy you're gonna be. <laughs> you go. Excellent. Doug. Doug. Okay. You've seen it done, no pressure. And <laughs> three, two, okay, scooch in just a little bit for me. There we go. Three, two, one, nice and loud. All right, guys, so today we're going to be talking about diminishing marginal utility. Now, first of all, marginal utility is an addition or a an increase or a decrease in pleasure created after consuming one additional unit of something. 
diminishing marginal utility is specifically a decrease in pleasure created after it's consuming one additional unit. So for me, my, um, my unit is going to be minutes spent horseback riding because I love riding horses. Now, after 30 minutes of horseback riding, I'm pretty happy, so I'm gonna rate the utility at a 10. I'm very happy. After 60 minutes, I'm pretty happy, but I'm also in a little bit of pain, so we're gonna put it <laughs> at about a seven. After 90 minutes, I'm getting pretty miserable. I'm hot, I'm sweaty, my horse is irritable, so we're gonna give it a three. After 120 minutes, I'm not even on the horse anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna make that a zero. Um, basically, diminishing marginal utility, a decrease in pleasure created after each additional unit. Too much of a good thing is a bad thing. Can you tell me your name one more time? Jade. Jade? Okay. Thank you, Doug and Jade. Well, well done. So one of the great things about one take video is that you can watch them right back. <laughs> I want to point out, it's always like this too. There, there's a magic involved in creation. There's an anticipation. Like we just they created something fairly s simple, uh, but there's still a magic. I can't wait to watch it. <laughs> I don't know why. Instant gratification. Yes. Okay, everybody, we're learning diminishing marginal utility today. Food is fun. That's all we're doing. Right, first of all, what it is, diminishing marginal utility. First, you need to know what marginal utility is, so that's what we're going to do. Marginal utility. De increase, decrease in pleasure by each unit you consume. So I don't like burgers. So we're going to talk about burgers today. So the thing is, is that if I have one burger, pretty good burger. So my marginal utility, that's what we're going to deal with. But it starts diminishing marginal utility, it's a decrease in pleasure by how many burgers are I going to win. So first of all, look, first burger, McDonald's makes me happy. A little look at me, all right? One burger, we're good to go, right? So I'm pretty happy over here, right? Two burgers, okay, I'm a little fat kid, feeling a little better, okay? Third burger, I'm not happy, indigestion central, right? Not good. So basically, as I increase the unit, I got more and more and more depressed. Therefore, food is fun, right? That's what I'm saying. So diminishing marginal utility is the more burgers you eat, the bigger and more unhappy you're going to be. <laughs> Doug. Dougie, 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 Doug. Some of you, yes. All right, guys. So today we're going to be talking about diminishing marginal utility. Now, first of all, marginal utility is an addition or an increase or a decrease in pleasure created after consuming one additional unit of something. Diminishing marginal utility is specifically a decrease in pleasure created after it's consuming one additional unit. So, for me, my um, my unit is going to be minutes spent horseback riding because I love riding horses. Now, after 30 minutes of horseback riding, I'm pretty happy, so I'm going to rate the utility at a 10. I'm very happy. After 60 minutes, I'm pretty happy, but I'm also in a little bit of pain, so we're going to put it at about a 7. After 90 minutes, I'm getting pretty miserable. I'm hot, I'm sweaty, my horse is irritable, so we're going to give it a 3. After 120 minutes, I'm not even on a horse anymore. <laughs> so we're going to make that a 0. Um, basically, diminishing marginal utility and decreasing after each additional unit. Too much of a good thing is a bad thing. <laughs> Jade. I love this activity uh, for this reason, and this is the title of my presentation, uh, Reviving the Art of Teaching. And what a simple way. So the question is to you guys, uh, which one was the best? Mine, Doug's, or Jade's? It's an economic answer, which is, it depends. <laughs> uh, but the, the real answer is, for my students, mine. For Doug's students, Doug's. For Jade's students, Jade's. As a matter of fact, using mine in Jade's class, even, it's so simple to create your own. 
uh, using mine may actually break down the relationship between the student and the teacher. The last thing we want is to have people say, teachers aren't necessary. Like we can outsource the delivery of content. Uh, no, we can't. The relationship between the student and the, the teacher is critical, absolutely critical. Not to mention, what this opens up is the relationship between the teacher and the parent to strengthen. You may never even meet them, but they're watching you every night with their child. Imagine that. They can actually help their child learn about diminishing margin and utility from the teacher. So when they come in, be like, what you're doing is amazing. I don't know economics, now I do. Parents learning as well. It's extremely powerful. So reviving the art of teacher, teaching is uh, uh, expressing your unique and valuable, because it is unique and valuable. Everybody in this room, strong, weak, whatever it is, your valuable organization, examples, explanation, and personality. And this process not only helps you express those and become that teaching artist, but also makes you better because of all the reflective nature of what's going into this work. So the second part is, <laughs> I, I, do, I, do a lot of, I do a lot of uh, work with high school teachers. And you want to hear the air leave the room with high school teachers, you say, no, no, we're going to film, you teach at U.S. history. You're going to film 57 videos that are 10 minutes long, and then you'll have all your class time open. <laughs> uh, what? <laughs> what? What? What in the world am I supposed to do with that class time? That, that's a lot of time. Block scheduling, 90 minutes every day, three times a day. You walk in and be like, oh, so you watch the 10-minute lecture. Okay, I give a quiz. Everybody did pretty well on it. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so the answer is the other part of reviving the art of teaching. Because this list right here is what I feel like when I, when, I start, when I wanted to be a teacher, when I went into the programs and, and sort of thought about the, the art of teaching, my art of teaching, I felt like I want, this is what I wanted to do. I want to do this every day, these things, right? Inquiry learning, investigation, collaboration, group work, discussions, labs, differentiation, arts integration, creating publishing. I did not realize that I would be lecturing for 60 minutes, second period, lecturing for 60 minutes, just to cover the content. Because I did as much of this stuff as I possibly could, and when it took two days to do a really cool si economic simulation, then I realized I was a day and a half behind on the pacing guide. And I had to g get right back, because I don't, I, uh, I'm gonna get in trouble. You know, like I'm, I'm, the kids aren't gonna be ready for the test, they're not gonna know the vocabulary, and so then I would lecture nonstop for 90 minutes for two days to catch up which those were fun days. So uh, I feel like this is, this is where we need, this is where the art of teaching comes in, the innovation of it, the experimentation. We're going to try an inquiry lesson today. You know what? If it doesn't work, i got a 10-minute video on the information that you can go review before class, after class, before the test, before the standardized test. As many times as you want. You can watch it with your parents. You can watch it without your parents. So uh, the thing I want to focus on here is the creation and publishing aspect. This opens up time, and what you've really done, which is so powerful, is that by creating this list, you walk into class and say, I've, got, I've said all there is to say it, I've published it. I have modeled that publishing for you. And the most powerful thing, well, they're going to want to do it. The most powerful thing you've done is model that. Well, how do I use my class time? Get them to create and publish, that higher order thinking. Give them a topic, be like, I've shown you what it means to create and publish a video, now you're gonna do it. I've sat in classroom after classroom where teachers have introduced the flipped classroom to their middle or, high, middle or high school students. And the first question from a student, they put the, their teacher goes up on the screen, and they're like, oh my gosh, you look ridiculous. Um, but they don't mean that, they, they're just like, oh, this is the great, you know, this way to take a chance, way to take a risk, this is awesome. Um, but the first question is, do we get to do it? Yeah, that's what we do with our class times. Push them to those higher order thingy skills. Give them the topic, have them create and publish because they want to do it, they've seen you do it, and that's really, really exciting. So uh, the other thing you could have them do is a direct response to your modeling. A really higher, oh, uh, the most, I think the most higher order thinking, the higher order thinking uh, skill you can do is be a teacher. Right? So break down the information. That's what we all do. We break down information and we deliver it to others in a way that makes sense. That's extremely hard to do. Why do first-year teachers struggle so bad and it's just about surviving? Because you're, you're taking all this information and you're trying to do this every day. It's rigorous. 
it's hard to do that, to constantly break it down. Like you have seven pages in a book, but you need to condense that. It needs to be in a deliverable manner. Otherwise, the students could just read the book and we wouldn't have any problems. So another great use of, of classroom time is, is for this purpose. So uh, that's sort of my take on it. Uh, and of course, there are tons of great ideas about what to use with your class time. I'm sure most of you have ideas. I, I've always wanted to try this, or I've always wanted to do this. We go to professional development all the time where people like me are telling you, hey, I got a bunch of songs. Well, most of the algebra teachers I've worked to flip their classroom, guess what they're doing? They're making music videos tomorrow. You know, they're showing music videos to their class. They're doing kinesthetic lectures. They're addressing different learning styles and they're really hitting those higher level thinking uh, skills, those levels. Which brings us back to uh, Elizabeth. Uh, and the world that I want for her. Because I, every time I present with a teacher, whatever they teach, I say, uh, I want Elizabeth to have this teacher for sixth grade science. I want a flipped teacher for Elizabeth because I refuse to accept that, that when she gets, you know, to be in middle school and high school and whatnot, and, uh, that, that we're, we stop that stuff, that we're done with it. I refuse to accept that. So I, uh, the rest of the time, I want to finish out our lesson on mitosis and then, and then wrap up. So um, to, to demonstrate the whole process, so we've, I've got my lecture video already at home, and I would assume that most of you have the background knowledge of mitosis somewhat. Uh, if you didn't watch the video at home, uh, you can participate this, in this as well. And guess what? If you're still confused, it's still there. Uh, and if you're confused again before the test, it's still there. The information's still there. You can access me whenever you want. But let's do something engaging with our class time. And uh, so if everybody'd stand back up. stages of interphase. The first stage is G1, where the cell grows. The second stage is called S. And in S, all the genetic material, the DNA chromosomes, are replicated. And the chromosomes are attached. You have the old chromosome and the identical copy new one are attached to what's called the centromere. And this pair is called a sister chromatid. So the third stage is called G2, and the cell continues to grow and does its final checks to make sure everything that was replicated was replicated properly so it can move in to cell division or mitosis. So the first verse goes like this. In interphase G1, the cell is growing. Then in S, the chromosomes replicate, twist up, and shorten. Here's how I demonstrate this. In interphase G1, we're going to have our right hand make the G, kind of backwards to us, but it looks right on the camera. So G1, the cell is growing. Then in S, the chromosomes replicate, twist up, and shorten. Okay, good. The second part of the verse. So 46 pairs of sister chromatids are here. Some say attached at the hip, I say attached at the centering. Uh-oh, in G2, the cell prepares for the show. Here's how we're going to demonstrate this part. So the 46 pairs would become sister chromatid, one chromosome on the other chromosome. So the 46 pairs of sister chromatids are here. Some say attached at the hip, I say attached at the centromere. Uh-oh, then we do a G and D with our right hand. G2, the cell prepares for a show. So that's the, the final checklist there. All right, let's try it all together slowly. <laughs> In interphase G1, the cell is growing. Then in S, the chromosomes replicate, twist up, and shorten. So the 46 pairs of sister chromatids are here. Some say attached at the hip. I say attached at the centromere. Uh-oh. In G2, 
The cell prepares for our show. Good, let's try it with the music. <laughs> Yeah, some of you, some of you, yes. One take video. <laughs> Thank you. 
So all the songs that I write for education are all free and available to download and the materials along with them on my website, IamLodge.com, like I am tall, just IamLodge.com. The bridge is about the third phase of my thesis, the anaphase, where those sister chromatids are pulled apart and separated. So here's how the bridge goes. In anaphase, the cell stretches adding cytoplasm, while the protein-heavy spindle fibers get up an atom. They reach out and pull the sister pairs apart, U46 to the left, U46 to the dark. Let's figure out how we're going to demonstrate this. All right, so in anaphase, the cell stretches adding cytoplasm, while the protein-heavy spindle fibers get up an atom, they reach out and pull the sister pairs apart, U46 to the left, U46 to the dark, and then we do this. <laughs> All right, let's try it again slowly. In anaphase, the cell stretches, adding cytoplasm, while the protein-heavy spindle fibers get up and down. They reach out and pull the sister pairs apart. U46 to the left, U46 to the dark. Duh, 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 duh. All right, let's try it with music. You remember everything so far? We're on the last part now, the third verse. Everybody's got, okay, good. Everybody's got everything? And uh, just, just so you know, if you have Discovery Education in your school, if you subscribe to Discovery Education streaming, you can also find uh, my songs and the, uh, other materials if you just search in the, tool, uh, the search bar, Lodge McCammon. So you can find a bunch of things as, there as well. The third verse is about the last phase of mitosis, telophase. And in telophase, a nuclear membrane forms around each of the 46 chromosomes that have been split apart. And uh, through cytokinesis, the cell actually gets pinched down the middle and divides and it creates two brand new 2N cells or diploid cells. So here's how the verse goes. A new nuclear membrane form around or forms around each set of the 46 chromosomes wound tight and thick. So here's how we're going to demonstrate this. So we're doing this, so at the end of the bridge, da, da, da. so a new nuclear membrane forms around each set of the 46 chromosomes wound tight and thick. Okay, that's good. The second part, we call it telophase when the middle gets pinched and the cytokinesis applies to that cytoplasm wrench uh-oh, two identical 2N cells in tow. Okay, so here's how we demonstrate this. So we got the fists up here. Uh, we call it telophase, we go fist, fist forward, we call it telophase when the middle gets pinched and the cytokinesis applies that cytoplasm wrench. Uh-oh, two identical 2N cells in tow. All right, let's try the whole thing together slowly. So, da, da, da. a new nuclear membrane form around each, each set of the 46 chromosomes wound tight and thick. We call it telophase when the middle gets pinched and the cytokinesis applies that cytoplasm wrench. Uh-oh, two 
two identical cells, or two identical 2N cells in tow. All right, let's try it with music. Very nice. So, sorry. All right, to prove to you that I know it, and I want to assess, because I haven't been facing you guys, to assess the class. <laughs> Here we go. If you would all do this with me, please. Start, start with the right leg. This is not on. All right, here we go with the right leg. Let me do a walk. You know this part. <laughs> Give yourselves a hand. Give yourselves a hand.
this is what, how I want Elizabeth to learn mitosis, at least part of her experience, you know, to be open to something like this, and other subjects as well, of course, uh, which is what I'm trying to do. Uh, but what the amazing things can happen with, with uh, allowing students the space and the structure to do something like this is a couple of months ago, a teacher sent me an email and says, and said, look what my kids did in some school in Florida, eighth graders in Florida. Look what my kids did. They, in, in, multiple, in different classes, they learned a song about Newton's first law. And they got together outside the classes and, and, were, and decided they were going to do a flash mob in the cafeteria at lunch. <laughs> Not only learning the content, being open to creative expression, but to make it totally socially relevant for their experience in life. So what we see here is eighth graders taking an enormous risk and, and how amazing that is. And it's about Newton's first law. It's about science. They are dancing about science in a socially relevant way, which is incredible. It is exactly, uh, it just, it was, it was very impactful for me. And then there's been more since then, of course. Uh, and there's some chatter about well, ours is going to be better than yours. And great, that's, that's fine. Um, the other thing, the, the lesson plan that, that is really exciting as well is a lesson plan around uh, uh, creativity. Because what I've really done, I am no dancer. Like I, I'm really just connecting basic kinesthetic movements and mo again modeling what it means to the, the thought process around creating kinesthetic movements to a song. So the real lesson plan is to take what I've done and then throw it out to the students. Like if we were in a class, I would say, okay, this section has the first verse. You guys have the first chorus, second verse, second chorus, now that we know the basics. And then I would challenge you to say, be creative, meaning, uh, Create different movements or add to the movements of what's already there and have a reason why and how it connects to that content. It starts a very interesting conversation. Like, how do we better show interface? Let's talk about that. Well, in the meantime, we're learning quite a bit about interface and, and processing that. Uh, it's an exciting lesson plan. So I just want to uh, play a, a short piece. Uh, this is a song about cells, and I did a music video contest with Discovery Education a, a, a little while back, and this was actually the second place video, but I like it because it's, it's kind of, uh, uh, it's, it's just interesting, and it's very creative. The kids took it to that next step and took the basic movements and really built off of that. So if you want to see that whole video, it's, uh, it's on YouTube, Dr. Lodge Sells Michigan. Uh, that's not what it's called, but that's how you find it. And uh, it's just an amazing, if given the opportunity to do creative expression, how everyone, I mean, we were all in here uh, uh, dancing a second ago about mitosis. Uh, it's a human characteristic. It's this desire to be artistic, to go back to our roots. And it's amazing to me, even though I, I'm one of those people who will say, 
that you know, high stakes standardized testing and those types of systemic problems have squelched creativity in our teachers and students. I will say that all day. Okay, th but then what? Um, well, there might be a solution for that. Students in flipped classrooms do better on standardized tests for obvious reasons. They have access to that content and they build better relationships. But uh, that we're also engaging students in ways that make sense. Uh, the ways that make sense to them and that they, they can take ownership over. So to help uh, spread this, I suppose, uh, we've gotten some funding uh, from uh, SAS, uh, which is a company in the Triangle, to experiment around building training programs uh, for educators around flipping the classroom and the more detailed uh, of, uh, issues with flipping the classroom. So uh, a f it's a free flip classroom training program and here's just sort of where we are with it that uh, for teachers we are in progress right now and October 14th our first <coughs> scaled round of training will end and we'll have one probably before the year is up uh, so uh, you, can, you can visit there. All the, all the materials are completely transparent 100%. You can access all the materials in the class if you just want to look through it and if you decide it's something you want to do uh, for real at a later date, uh, you can sign up when it becomes available again. Uh, for undergraduates, uh, we are, are piloting the training uh, and we're looking for people who are in undergraduates who are interested in piloting this, uh, uh, the online program, because we have plenty of undergraduates at NC State, uh, but we have some undergraduates at Duke who have signed up, UNC, uh, nobody outside of the state yet. So if you want information about that, you can visit uh, the second website there. Uh, for professors, we are working with professors in graduate school uh, in engineering, undergrad undergraduate in biology and nutrition right now, uh, building the uh, training program for professors. We have a lot of it already up there uh, for professors who, which, again, it's all totally open. If you just want to go through and see what's there and see what the process is, uh, you can feel free to do that as well. And it's okay if you didn't write these all these down, if you're interested in those. Uh, so this is uh, flipping the classroom, uh, the, the, I'm sorry, the FIS project at the Friday Institute. The link at the top is the general link for the project that I work on. All the training links are there as well uh, if you want to uh, check that out. And there's, there's links, there's tutorial, video, one take tutorials on everything I talked about here. Every thought in my head I just make a video about because it's so easy and it helps people, it helps cut down the questions. So, so where, do you, where do you buy these boards? Link. Where do you, you know, how do you write on the boards? Link. Uh, everything has a link. It's my life. So uh, also on Facebook, we'll, we will announce the new training programs as they're developed, launching the training programs, new availability of the programs, uh, mostly on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, but you can check back to the sites if you, if you want to find out that way too. So in summary, uh, the FIS project is about utilizing one take video like we've seen today in a couple different ways to remove the lecture from the classroom to have students or have teachers differentiate in their instruction for students and to hit multiple learning styles. And a couple months ago, my dad called me up and he said, I've got a great tagline for the end of your talks. And he said, life is too short. Stop repeating yourself. Flip your classroom. <laughs> Thank you very much.